Hello to everyone that is joining. I can see lots of people flooding in. Uh, welcome to this WSET Global Webinar on the wine regions of England. Um, if you're joining us just now, please feel free to say hello in the chat. Say where you're from. If maybe some of you are, it's even late enough that you're enjoying some some English uh, English wine. Um, we will get started in just a moment. I'm just seeing more people come in. But let me tell you a little bit more about us while people join. Um, so my name is Sam Hovey. I am an educator working for um, the Wine and Spirit Education Trust. We are the world's leading provider of qualifications and courses in wines, spirits and sake. Uh, we teach qualifications in 70 different countries uh, through 800 different course providers, including the one that I work for in London. Um, just a quick reminder, this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available um, via the Global Events Hub on YouTube later today. And if you have any questions at any point, I'll have some time at the end to answer them. Please put them in the Q&A box and I will try to get through as many as possible. Um, but I think we've got quite a few people in now, so let's get started. Um, right, I wanted to begin with just a little bit of history um, of English wine. So the, the grapevine is not native to the UK. Uh, it was brought here by the Romans when they invaded in 34 AD. So going quite far back, um, all the way just, uh, just about 2000 years ago. Uh, so they, they brought it originally and planted a small amount of vines. But basically for the last 2000 years, not very much has happened. So we see small recordings of, of plantings going through the Middle Ages. The best evidence is that they sort of came and went depending on the climate. So, for example, there was a little bit more planting during a period of time known as the medieval warm phase, when temperatures were a little bit warmer than usual. And in fact, in, in, 18, uh, in 1087, the Doomsday Book records 42 vineyards planted in Europe, uh, in, in the UK rather. Um, however, you had then had something called the Little Ice Age that came along for about 450 years, uh, which pretty much put a stop to most viticulture in the UK. Moving ahead just a little bit to the 1950s, we see very small scale commercial plantings happening, but really only a handful of vineyards, including Hambledon, which is a producer that's still making wine today which was founded by the brilliantly named Major General Sir Guy Salisbury Jones. So if you can find a better name than that, I please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, so uh, very, very small scale planting, not that significant. In 1964, the UK produced a grand total of 1,500 bottles of wine, to give you an idea of how little wine we produced as recently as the 1960s. Going into the 1980s, the UK is importing a lot of German style wine, so things like Liebfrau Milch, and at the same time you again see the beginnings of some plantings of German grape varieties, which we'll discuss in a little bit, but again production stays very small indeed. Things change though in the late 80s and particularly in the 1990s. So in 1988 there was an American couple called Sandy and Stuart Moss. They purchased a medieval estate in Sussex called Nightimber. And they were advised at the time not to bother planting any vines, to plant orchards instead, but they ignored that advice because they wanted to produce wine and specifically sparkling wine. Four years later, in 1992, they produced their first sparkling wine and the following vintage, 1993, was subsequently awarded the best sparkling wine in the world at the International Wine and Spirits Competition. And at that moment, and that award was given in 1998, English wine, um, UK wine uh, finally got the recognition that uh, it had never received before. And since the uh, turn of the millennia into the 2000s, we've seen a massive expansion in plantings and in production of wine. So let's have a look at where we are today. At the moment in the UK, we have roughly speaking 3,928 hectares of vines. To put that into perspective, that is around about 10% of the vineyard area of a region like Champagne, for example. And almost all of that planting, or certainly more than half of it, has happened in the last 
13 or so years. So the 2010s, so from 2010 to 2020, 2,200 hectares of that nearly 4,000 hectares were planted. At the moment, at the rate of planting that we're seeing in the 2020s, um, we're projected to have almost double that size uh, of vineyard area by 2032. So around 7,600 hectares in total. Uh, so planting is continuing at quite a big pace. And as you can see from this map here, the vast, vast majority of that is located in England. So I might slip between saying British wine and English wine. Um, of course, we shouldn't forget our friends in Wales as well, who are producing a small amount of wine as well. And we will discuss them in a bit more detail in a while. So just want to take you through some of the great varieties that you're likely to find in the UK. The vast majority of plantings are Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. So those kind of three classic grape varieties that are used as the template for most sparkling wine production, uh, particularly in areas like Champagne, but also in California, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, we've also got a couple of more unusual grape varieties, Bacchus and Saval Blanc. So both Bacchus and Saval Blanc were grape varieties designed in Germany. There, uh, Bacchus is a crossing of a grape variety called Silvana, which you might not know, and a grape variety called Riesling, which you may be more familiar with. And basically these grapes were designed to ripen in very, very cool climates. And that is exactly what the UK has, and particularly in the past had a very, very cool climate. So these grape varieties a little bit more, uh, they represent a little bit more of the heritage of wine production in the UK, but they still make us make up a substantial portion of plantings. And then again, some other great varieties in smaller quantities, things like Solaris, Reichensteiner, no, no prizes for guessing where that was invented, uh, Pinot Noir Precoce, which is a mutation of Pinot Noir, Rondo, and a little bit of Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio also planted as well. In terms of the styles of wine that we produce in the in this country, um, around about two thirds, just over just over two thirds is sparkling wine, and about one third is still wine, and that's been pretty constant over the past three years. Of the sparkling wine that we make, almost all of it is produced using the traditional method, so that is uh, making a still base wine, putting it into a bottle, adding sugar and yeast and then having the second fermentation take place in the bottle itself, which is the same means of production for Champagne, Carver, Method Cap Classique, and many other premium sparkling wines throughout the world. Still wine has become uh, important, and I think it will become increasingly important in the future. Most of that is white wine, and grapes like uh, Bacchus are a little bit more important for the production of these still white styles of wine. A good chunk of that is rosé as well, and a small portion is red. It's quite a lot of different stuff there. And by the way, guys, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and I'll answer them at the end. But that's just a very brief overview of the UK. What I now want to do is get into the specifics of where you're going to find vineyards in uh, this country. So about 75% of vineyards are located in the southeast of England. So if you see on this map here, there's a, a gray splodge. Let me just bring up a, um, a laser pointer there. That gray splodge is London. And when I say the southeast, I mean this kind of area through here. So we're looking at um, Kent and then into East and West Sussex and over into Hampshire as well. I'm also including Essex in that kind of 75% figure as well. Why is that? Why the southeast? Well. We are in a fairly marginal climate, and despite the fact that the climate has warmed over the past 150 years, um, we're still at the very northern limit of where you can ripen grapes. We, in the southeast of England, we have a, a climate that is roughly equivalent in terms of annual temperature to Champagne about 60 years ago. There are some differences though. Importantly, we have a much more maritime climate than they do in somewhere like Champagne. Um, so we've got lots more rainfall, which can create all sorts of problems for our growers. And while climate change has enabled the expansion of viticulture in the UK, it's also brought some significant challenges with it. For example, we have um, quite 
quite severe frost that can decimate vineyards in the spring. Uh, there are problems of flooding. And as you can see in this picture here, this was from 2020, uh, we get drought as well. So even though the, the climate has warmed and generally speaking, that has made things easier in the UK, it also brings with it much more unpredictability, which makes England a particularly difficult place to grow grapes. Despite that though, it is happening. And one of the key factors in doing so successfully is choosing the correct vineyard sites. So generally speaking, sheltered south facing slopes are essential for producing the best quality grapes. So if we have a look at this uh, picture here, this is a, uh, a picture of a really small producer called Breaky Bottom in Sussex. And what you can see here is just how tucked away the vineyard is this is a photo i took on the top of this hill and believe you believe you me it was incredibly windy up here but when you go down into that uh into that kind of hollow it's much more calm uh, and as a result we can ripen grapes really nicely um soil is also very important as well now uh, there's quite a lot of discussion about chalk if you hear people talk about the uk they often might mention to you that there is a seam of chalk that runs from Paris around through Champagne under the English Channel and then pops up again in the south of England, particularly the north and the south of Downs. And chalk is very is a very important soil. It drains uh, rainwater very effectively, which is fantastic in a country that is as wet as the UK. But as you can see in this photo here from Exton Park, it's also quite pale in colour, which means it reflects sunlight, which helps grape ripening. However, it's not all about chalk, as important as it is. We have lots of limestone in our soils, which does a very similar thing. It drains very effectively. Um, but also things, uh, the type of sandy soil called green sands, that again provides very effective drainage. And for any of you that know a little bit about viticulture, you might be surprised to learn that um, chalk, uh, sorry, uh, that clay is really important as well. So this is a picture from Danbury Ridge in Essex. And these are some of the chalk soils that they plant their vines on. Um, in the wettest years, clay is not always ideal, but when it's blended with things like gravel and sand, it can provide the right balance between retaining water in the drier years and um, draining water in the wetter years. And one of the things that this kind of clay does when it's very dry is it cracks like this, which can make life a little bit easier for the vines because they can get their roots a little bit further down. So not just all about chalk in the UK, we've got lots of other soils uh, where you'll see very good quality wine planted as well, very good quality vines planted as well. So that was the southeast of England. If I just go back to that map there, there we go. So again, the vast majority of plantings down in what is the warmest and sunniest part of the UK. But we do have another 25% in the other areas in England and outside of England as well. So let's have a look at these. Um, if we go back to the map here, there's a fair amount of production in the southwest of the country. So we're talking about areas like uh, Dorset, up in uh, Gloucestershire over here, and then down in Cornwall and Devon as well. As you can see, these areas here are particularly exposed to the sea. Um, you've got quite powerful uh, weathers, very wet, uh, very, very wet weather, lots of uh, wind, which again means that having those sheltered sites is more important than ever. Um, but these areas are important centers of production, especially for still wines. Um, so lots of still wine being produced up in Gloucestershire, uh, but also in Cornwall and Devon as well. Over in East Anglia, we have Norfolk and then Suffolk and then Essex. Um, these areas are becoming increasingly important. Um, Essex in particular, and especially in the Crouch Valley, is the driest and sunniest part of the UK. And that has resulted in a particular um, reputation for high quality still wines. You need a bit more ripeness in your grapes to make good quality still wine than you do sparkling wine, which is why historically, or at least within the last 20 years, we've really focused on fizz. However, as you can see, about a third of our wine nowadays is still 
and some of the best examples coming out of out of Essex here. So again, particularly an area called the Crouch River Valley uh, has become especially associated with these top, top quality Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs. So if you're looking for a good quality English red wine, there are worse places to start than Essex. All right. And here we go. It, this is the, a picture of the Crouch River Valley here. So it's fairly flat. Um, and then you can just see the, the river running out into the, um, into the North Sea just over there. Okay. Um, we've also got vineyards being planted in the Midlands. So over here, um, up into uh, Yorkshire as well. And of course, in Wales, I think altogether, there are about 30 or so vineyards in these areas. Production is very small. It's a small percentage of the total um, because being a little bit further north, and I think you can see from this map here in the green, these are substantially wetter areas with less sunshine. Um, it has, even with the warming climate, been a little bit more difficult to produce um, good quality wine in the past, but that is changing and it's changing very quickly. So if I think if we go to the next photo, this is a picture of uh, White Castle Vineyards in Monmouthshire. So they're just outside of Cardiff in the south of Wales, planted back in 2001. And I've tried some absolutely fantastic uh, still wines from them, particularly red wines that they've um, produced in the slightly warmer vintages. Um, so there are, again, a small but growing number of producers over in Wales. And going up to um, Yorkshire, um, this is a picture from Junesford, which is in the Vale of York, just outside of the city uh, itself. Um, a relatively small family producer. But again, I think in the future, if temperatures, and let's be honest, they probably will be continuing to increase, we're going to see much more production in these parts of the country. So just to give you a very brief kind of summary of, of those different regions, the vast majority of production down in the southeast of England, usually the warmest and sunniest place. The fact that we can produce as much wine as we do nowadays is mainly due to the fact that temperatures have increased and we now have a similar climate to Champagne about 60 or so years ago. Um, as the climate continues to warm, I would anticipate that we're going to see more and more viticulture in these slightly cooler areas like Yorkshire, like Wales, like the Midlands. So watch this space. Now that concludes a very whistle stop tour, very whistle stop, a whistle stop tour of um, the UK and its different wine regions. Now I can see some questions. So bear with me two moments. If you have any questions at all, please just pop them in the chat, oh, sorry, in, in the Q&A box, um, in the Q&A box. And let's see here. Um, so Crystal asks, where is the biggest exporting markets for English sparkling wine? Um, the United States is a very important market for um, English and English sparkling and still wine, as are Nordic countries like Sweden and Norway. Um, and there's also a significant amount being exported to places like Japan as well. How much wine is exported? Uh, Lottie, I have to double check that for you. It's certainly a number that is increasing. Um, Alexander asks, what about vine planting densities and yields? Are they similar to Champagne or are there any differences? Well, what I can say is that the yields in the UK compared to places like Champagne are much lower. The main reason for that is the climate is still variable. So in the best years, yields are significantly um, significantly higher from the national average. So a good example of this would be 2018, where the annual production was about double the long run average, um, but then they can plummet in the worst years. And the main reason for that is if you've got quite heavy rainfall, you'll have significant problems with fungal disease. The other thing that can really cut yields in the UK is frost. So um, when the temperature begins to increase in the spring and the vines wake up, you have a risk of frost coming in to uh, damage those vines and particularly stop them from producing as much, as many grapes in that year as you otherwise might be able to. Andrew asks, Sam, what 
worries you most about English wine production? There are regular criticisms about price and the very fast expansion in the last five years leading to overproduction. How do you see those issues being resolved? I mean, I don't have too much in the way of worries about the English wine industry. Um, in regards to the price, the average price of English sparkling wine is high. There are a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is that, as I was just discussing, the yields are quite low. And if you're a small producer, it means you have to charge a little bit more for a bottle to cover all of your running expenses. The other reason is that the amount of time that many of these wines spend aging, particularly aging on their lees, is significantly in excess of the minimums required by law uh, and significantly in excess of what you might see in somewhere like Carver, for example. And that adds cost. The final reason that the costs are quite high is that this is still a pretty small scale industry by comparison to the likes of Carver, Prosecco and Champagne. And that means that they don't quite yet have economies of scale that these other more established regions have. But that is changing. Um, as individual producers grow, you can see the costs that they sell their wine for decreasing. Um, but also as the industry grows itself, it can harness external economies of scale. So, for example, getting access to the specialist training and equipment providers that other regions have been more used to benefiting from in the past. Um, and in terms of, again, in terms of sort of price, you are beginning to see um, certain brands selling their traditional method sparkling wines for, uh, you know, just under about £30 a bottle, which is comparable to traditional method sparkling wine of, the sim of a similar quality in other regions. In terms of expanding too fast, I don't think it's expanding too fast. Um, as I kind of, you know, just, just said earlier, the hectareage under vine at the moment is about 10% of that of Champagne, for example. And the style of wine, the quality level of wine being produced in the UK is fairly high. This is not an industry that is looking to produce vast quantities of wine, but a sustainable amount that can be sold to the kind of markets that are looking for that really, really top end stuff. Okay, um, right. Wesley uh, Howell asks, is there a system of regional designation or labeling evolving in the UK? Uh, the answer is predominantly no. And the reason is because the industry is still very new indeed. And as a result, um, regions are still trying to figure out exactly the precise kind of style. So what makes a, a Kentish wine Kentish versus a wine from Essex, um, like a wine from Essex? And that's still a still an open question. Um, there is a protected designation of origin for West Sussex, um, but that isn't something that has been widely adopted. And to be honest with you, I don't think it will be widely adopted in the future. OK. Um, Joanna uh, comments, I live near Renshaw Hole. I think they've had vineyards for quite a long time, potentially before the Second World War recently been producing really good quality and prize winning wines. Absolutely. Um, as I said, while the production before the 1960s was was pretty, pretty small, there have been vineyards here and there dotted around for, for quite a long time, um, sometimes in, in surprising places. Uh, Mark Paul asks, what are some of the red varieties for still wine? That's an excellent question. Uh, the most important one is Pinot Noir. So um, Pinot Noir has really been the focus of quality red wine production in recent years. Uh, if you go back a little bit further, some of those Germanic grape varieties, things like a Rondo and Regent have been important and are still planted, particularly in those slightly cooler, more northerly areas. But Pinot Noir is definitely the focus of production in the future, and you'll see quite a lot more still red Pinot Noir in the future. Um, right, what else do we have here? Because we've got a couple of questions again about GIs. Um, uh, Abba Gozavi uh, asks, does England make fortified wine? Uh, no, no, we don't. Um, we obviously have a long tradition of drinking quite a lot of it, specifically port and sherry. I don't think we'd see very much English fortified wine in the, in the future purely because it's a style, it's a category of wine where demand is dropping quite quickly and we're very well furnished with our imports from Portugal 
and Spain. Um, are English people drinking local wines? Yes, a very important component of the wine industry. Uh, thank you, Marina, for the question, is um, cellar door sales. So it's a very large proportion of your average producer's um, sort of distribution channels. They're getting quite a lot of wine by selling to people that are visiting the vineyards. That's very much something that producers are investing quite a lot of money in. Uh, and the reason is very understandable. You get to cut out all of the sort of the middlemen that traditionally exist in the wine industry if you can sell directly. So you're seeing lots of people offering tours, tastings, but also wine clubs as well. And very much taking that model that you see in places like California and Australia of connecting directly with the consumers. Yeah, definitely, that's really, really important. Okay. Um, what else? Okay, um, Romaric uh, says, hi from Paris. Hi, Romaric. Uh, could you be a little bit more specific about the style of still white wines? Is there a main style? Well, again, this is something that is evolving very quickly. Um, so I don't think I would say that there is a sort of one definitive style of English still white wine, but there are a few different ones. Um, Bacchus is a very important grape variety. Again, this is that German variety, a little bit more of a heritage, um, has a bit more of a heritage status, but is still really important. And that produces a light bodied, very floral uh, style of wine with this distinctive elderflower quality, a little bit like a Sauvignon Blanc um, from a cooler region. Um, the other style that you're seeing quite a lot of is still Chardonnay. Obviously, that's the most planted grape variety in the UK, so it makes sense that people are producing still Chardonnays from that. These range from being very light-bodied and crisp, sort of like a shabbly, through to something that has fairly high acidity, so is still nice and fresh, but may have been matured in oak or may have been matured with significant lees aging, so that it has uh, an additional level of flavor complexity and a little bit of extra texture. I find that those examples, particularly those that have been aged on their lees, tend to be the best because naturally English still wine has a quite high level of acidity. So that texture you get from lees aging really helps to balance out the, um, the, the, the naturally high acidity. Paul uh, asks if climate increases, will production of red wine increase as well? Yes, Paul, almost certainly. Of all of the styles of wine produced, uh, sp sparkling, still white, rosé, and then red, red wines tend to require the most ripeness because you're going to be extracting tannin and flavor from the skin of the grapes. Um, and as a result, it's something that is in the past only been well done in the warmest vintages, but what's been changing is the fact that the average temperature is increasing. So the quality of English red wine has improved and the consistency of that quality, quality has improved substantially in the last 10 years. And I only see that, um, only see that increasing in the future. All right, um, let's have a look. Uh, John, with the frosts, have there been any attempts for late harvest or ice wine varietals? That's a great question. Um, I have actually tried an English ice wine, but it was produced by freezing the grapes in um, essentially a very fancy freezer. Uh, that producer no longer makes the wine because they realized that using lots of electricity probably wasn't the best. It's not cold enough in the UK in the winters to produce ice wine naturally. And that's by virtue of our maritime climate. So um, winters in the UK are not fun, um, but they're certainly not as cold as they might be in parts of Germany or in Canada where most ice wine is produced. Late harvest is tricky to produce as well because we have quite a bit of rainfall and that can cause disease, which damages the grapes. So you can't make good quality wine as a result of that. I think I've got time for just one more question. Um, let's have a look. Okay, so um, let's see here. Oh, a lovely question there. Um, is Stephen Spurrier's winery still in production after his passing? Uh, yes, it is. Um, so Stephen um, Spurrier was a famous uh, wine merchant and educator, uh, and he has a wine located down in Dorset, 
called Bride Valley. And uh, as far as I'm aware, yes, it is still producing. Um, but guys, that's about our time for today. I'm so sorry I couldn't get through any more questions. Um, a feedback poll has just popped up. So if you could uh, please complete that, that would be really helpful. Just a reminder that a recording of this session will be available to um, everyone to watch on our WSET Events Hub on YouTube. And if you enjoyed this session, we've got two more lined up with myself on the 14th of November. So in just about two weeks time, we are looking at Argentina's main wine regions. And then on the 23rd of January, I'll be kicking off the new year by looking at Greece. So we hope to see you at those in the future. If not, if you want to find out anything more about studying for the WSET um, qualifications, please go to wsetglobal.com. But once again, thank you all very much for your time. I hope you have a lovely day and I hope you enjoy some English wine in the near future. Cheers, everyone. I'll speak to you very soon. Thank you.